question and answer period will be predicated upon how many of you guys are awake when I'm done speaking. Um, thank you, uh, Chuck and Inza, uh, amazing partners, AECOM and uh, Boeing for hosting this. Uh, Chuck's, Chuck's point is right on that we cannot have the, the robust dialogue within the government and private sector unless we have awesome sponsors who could help us along the way and help uh, share not only the burden of gathering, but share the message we want to uh, parlay with the risks and threats that we have facing our gradation. So thank you to everyone as we move forward. Uh, what I wanted to do uh, in my a lot of time here before the awesome panel uh, comes up, because you do have an amazing panel of uh, really good experts who can really drive some common themes and solutions uh, for you to take out of here. And I think that's the ultimate goal. My job is to be able to get everybody motivated why supply chain matters, and then uh, have a great panel to be able to drive at home with uh, relevant information. So that's my plan. I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, on specifics with respect to the threat and the vulnerabilities that we face as a nation, and then get to what's more important for me, the mitigations and things that we have to look for and what we can take as a message back to uh, the constituents. And I think with the, the overall umbrella mindset that representing the government so my authorities uh, are the government and advising and informing the private sector. Uh, the government doesn't really make anything, right? We buy it all, uh, whether it be Department of Defense, whether it be GSA, we buy, but the private sector makes it. So the supply chain threat and vulnerabilities really lay at the foot of the folks who make everything. And it's the government's job to be effective and efficient and explain to those who make this, that, and these, what the threat is, what the vulnerability is. And the overarching problem we'll get to is what is supply chain? Who owns supply chain? You think of a company, a business, a government organization, there's usually not a supply chain office. There's not a supply chain threat office. There's not a vulnerability office. There's security, there's a CIO, there's a CISO, there's a CSO, there's acquisition, there's procurement, there's general counsel, all these folks. But when you talk about supply chain, Really, it's hard to find out who's in charge, who owns it. Very similar that we had four or five years ago, six years ago, ten years ago on cyber, and I would venture even still today with the belly button in a company, an organization, or in a government facility. So as Chuck mentioned, we uh, last month uh, deemed April uh, Supply Chain Integrity Month with an effort to really push the message throughout our country that the supply chain threat and vulnerabilities have to be known and mitigated. So in order to mitigate them, you have to know what they are. And the supply chain threats that we face from nation states are first and foremost the most vulnerable part of what we do. We'll talk a little bit about that and some examples. And oftentimes what you see in the news and the media and alerts that are put out, um, you don't really understand that they're because of a supply chain vulnerability or threat that we saw against supply chain. Raise your hand if you saw the bulletin two weeks ago that was joint between uh, DHS, FBI, and the Brits on supply chain. Five. <coughs> Raise your hand again. Let me just make sure it's not five. Maybe we have seven. Do you remember what it was? No, she has no idea. She read it, but she has no idea what it was. Anybody out there want to guess what it was? Okay, so it was an official document put forth by two the best, most amazing democratic countries ever invented, us and the Brits, about the vulnerability of supply chain, primarily to our energy sector, by the Russians. So we took a little stab at this to say, how, how are we getting the message out? We're not doing a good job, I'll be honest with you. A lot of this falls on my shoulders. We have to do a better job of making sure that when we see vulnerabilities, we put the efforts out, we have to fight all the other news were the items, all the other threats that we face, the investigations, the issues, nuclear issues, and we gotta be able to say, at the end of the day, here are threats and vulnerabilities that impact how we do our business. So I wanna walk you through a couple things that I think are important with respect to supply chain. That it's not just a threat. The vulnerability that we face put this down, from our adversaries, primarily Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, the ability to penetrate our supply chain. I'm not gonna be uh, really detailed how that works, but you could figure it out. Uh, when you look at, when you 
I'm using the metaphor of a home, right? You're gonna build a home. You're gonna subcontract with a subcontractor to build your home. Beautiful home. You pay the subcontractor a down payment, and then completion, you get a mortgage, and then you're happy. You have floor plans, you're excited. But oftentimes, you don't know who they're hiring as the mechanical, what plumbing subcontractor they're hiring, who's doing the sheetrock and the taping, who's the carpet contractor, who's putting your cabinets in, who's doing utility work from your house to the street. Those are things that you don't know about and you don't care about. Should you? As a home buyer, probably not. But think about what those subcontractors are getting. Your architectural plans. Your general contractor, when he wires out your building and he says, okay, you want these cool speakers in the living room, in the, in the bedroom, in the hallway. Well, the electrical contractor gets those plans. Think about that from a business perspective. If you're subcontracting on IT services, the company X, the company X says, okay, we're gonna do the routers, we're gonna do the main wiring, we're gonna do the services, but for this particular genre, we have to subcontract this out to another company. If you are the host company, are you really all that engaged and aware of who that secondary company is? My argument is that we need to be. We need to be. We need to be totally engaged in how that process works. When you look at the history of the supply chain threat in the last five years, it's manifested in multiple ways. Primarily, number one, most important, I guess, Vulnerability we have and how it's manifested is in the spear fishing. Successful spear fish. So we looked at over um, the last, I think, seven years of uh, successful exfiltration of data, primarily in the PII world, uh, both in the government and the private sector. 90% of all that data was stolen due to a successful spear fish. Because you might have heard me say this before, but we as Americans have an unbelievable inability to not click a link. We just can't do it. We see a good link and we click it. A video, a hyperlink, a story, that's all you need to do for adversaries to get into your system. And if you are the general counsel, you work in the uh, business and you have access and connectivity to your business, now they're in your business. And that's what happens. Some of the humongous breaches we saw in the last, I guess, year or so on the DOD side, very, very sensitive information stolen by adversaries due to a spearfish success. So some of that is human controllables. Can we control the ability of us to not click a link? We have trained and trained and trained and trained. Last October, I was out on the West Coast with some major companies and their IT folks trying to under, understand what the process is for them. What we found out is even in the big IT companies, even the big social media companies, they have the same issues. So what you're gonna see, I think, in the future, and we already saw it in Great Britain, is a process where the company and or the government has developed algorithms and capabilities to prevent you from clicking on links that aren't trusted. I think that's a start, but it's also an indication that we as humans can't be trusted to protect our own stuff. I think that's okay, that's a realization. Otherwise it becomes insanity to try to protect the same thing over and over and over, and it's not working. Okay, so we all get the threat. I'm not gonna belabor the part that our adversaries want everything that we have. First of all, the Russia doesn't make anything. The economy is not that great. China has forever and ever stolen our best and brightest and they beat us to market, which is problematic. The issues with direct foreign investment the process, you've heard all that, you've seen on the news, we're making progress in the country and trying to make America the most efficient and effective economy with an, an advancement and moving forward with our industrial process and ensuring security of what we make and how we make it. And that is first. How does that begin? And I'm going to parlay this at the government side as well as the industry side because we're kind of both the same way. For years and years and years, whether your government or your industry, come the end of the calendar year, the fiscal year, we have to cut budget. A couple things get cut first. Number one is training, number two is security. 
Anybody disagree with that? So to me, we have to upside that. And my argument has been, in the government, it will be in the private sector, security, writ large, and we'll talk about what that means to me, has to be enterprise-wide, and it has to be mission. Regardless of what you do, what you make, what you service, security has to be part of your mission. And sometimes in order to get there, we may have to sacrifice a little bit mission to get security where it needs to be. One actor I'll talk about is we see some threats manifested and we see some issues. Some of the most important things we have in the government, in the private sector, are data centers. They hold a lot of data. Your data, my data, PII, financial data, corporate data, cloud data. Everybody's information goes to a cloud, right? Those clouds are somewhere. They're not in the sky. They are somewhere in a building. Those buildings have what's called heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The most critical component, component of those data processing centers are how they're cooled. Well, modern technology, in order to have the most efficient and effective air conditioning systems, they have to be tied to the internet so they can constantly update their processes, their information, the information back from the, uh, the processors in the HVAC back to the home company so they can service it. It's amazing. But that provides a lot of vulnerability for adversaries and criminal elements to implement nefarious <laughs> activity onto those systems. So let's assume hypothetically a big data processor that has all of our information in it goes down because the HVAC is compromised and we lose all our data. The CEO says, what happened? Someone tells the CEO, the HVAC, HVAC system went down because of a cyber attack, cyber attack which is manifested in either human-enabled activity or spear phishing. So if you're the CEO and you go to general counsel, who is responsible for the HVAC system? <laughs> building maintenance, building management? Are they part of the security apparatus of the company? I don't think so, I would venture they're not. So then the CEO gets mad and he blames the CISO because it was a cyber attack. Is the CISO thinking about HVAC systems, systems in their building? Should be, probably not right now. So the solution with respect to supply chain mitigation in the private sector and the government is having the right people at the table. If we do two things, number one, we elevate security, enterprise-wide security, as a mission element, whether you are a mom and pop shop in Indiana making widgets or you're a Boeing, it doesn't make a difference. Security needs to be mission for the enterprise. So what's in security? You have your CISO, you have your CSO, you have your IT, your CIO, you have your chief of counterintelligence, maybe you might have a chief risk officer. The general counsel needs to be part of that board. But I'm going to add two that nobody really thinks about. Acquisition and procurement. You could have the best cyber program in your company and you could hire up the outside of your company to a private cyber security firm, have the best software, you feel you're protected, but if your procurement and acquisition folks are not part of your team, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail, I promise. Because our adversaries, that's how they get us, through acquisition and procurement programs. Because if you are the CISO, the CIO, all those acronyms, are you aware of all the procurement that's being done by your company to buy new printers or scanners Faxes, PBX switches, routers? Probably not. Probably not. Just two years ago, we issued for the government a basic standard that for the GSA to go out and procure any government agency before you procure something, you have to do minimum due diligence. Like Google the company. Very sophisticated counterintelligence activity. Google. Find out who's on the board of directors. And if they are providing you IT services, who are their subcontractors? Is it a, country, a company out of Russia, China, Iran? And if it is, that's okay. Doesn't mean it's bad. 
But you need to be aware of that, right? So if you hire a general contractor to do your IT services, one of the subs that has to maybe that puts the people to that contract might be a foreign company. The Defense Department does this every single day. We do what's called NIDS, National Intell Intelligence Determinations for companies that want to do business with the government all the time. It's a big process. So my proffer is the private sector needs to do this more often. Understand who your suppliers of the suppliers are. Because our adversaries strike us with the subcontractors and the subs of the subs to get in our chain. Let's think back just a few years. Anybody not remember the OPM data breach? Right? Raise your hand if you've been a victim. Right? Look around the room. We're all victims, right? Their adversaries breach the OPM database. Raise your hand if you say yes. Nobody, right? right? Did they breach the mainframe of OPM? No. They breached a contractor for OPM. And they went from that contractor to another government agency, from that government agency to OPM. They knew what they were doing. And they knew they can get in to where they wanted to get in by going to the contractor's subcontract. Right? We have to learn from our mistakes. But at the same time, we cannot fight last year's war. We cannot fight that because as we move forward, and as we drive new solutions to technology, and as business creates the most effective and efficient ways to conduct business, we have to keep up to speed with how to mitigate the vulnerabilities that are there. Last week I had spent some really, really quality time with a couple agencies on the intelligence side, NSA, CIA, and then DHS and FBI, trying to understand the process of how we do um, notifications and processes. There are a lot of notifications coming out of the government about threats and vulnerabilities. As part of that enterprise-wide solution that your company should have, you should absolutely make sure that you have a conduit to the most up-to-date threat information possible from the government. That comes in two forms. That comes in number one, being part of official organizations that promulgate that information whether they be InfraGuard or one of the uh, ISACs or one of the other official processes where you as a CSO or a CISO or Chief Security Officer or Chief Risk Officer are obtaining everyday real life data from the cyber centers to help facilitate and mitigate your cyber intrusion defense as well as what the intelligence says. Also, your company should have the old fashioned human contact, right? We are all built based upon relationships. You need to ensure that the folks who are helping protect your enterprise have the right personal relationships, having those coffee sessions three, four, five times a year with the folks who can help them make a phone call. Some of the best mitigations are phone calls to the general counsel or CSO <coughs> saying, hey, did you see this report about this vulnerability? I think your company might have to take a look at it. That's very valuable. So the personal connections coupled with the official partnerships and um, memberships to these organizations are going to provide you the best conduit of that information. Because if you're in the private sector, you're in the government, you are flooded with information, flooded with threat information. It comes fast and first. Patch this, patch that, malware issues. So moving forward with the malware issue, let's take that for an example. If you get notified in the government and or in the private sector, that a supply chain company that you hired, a subcontractor, has introduced malware into your company. Whether it be from a nefarious perspective or not, it's in. What do you do about it? Who do you tell? Who should know? Well, it depends. So my proffer here today is have a plan. As part of Supply Chain Integrity Month, one of the main conduits we want to push forward is the concept of have a plan, practice the plan. Have a plan, practice the plan. This is not all that different than a cyber intrusion. My argument is it's kind of the same. So if we go back to our construct of the board, let's just say, the, the Enterprise Security Board, the Chief Risk Officer, the CISO, 
the CSO, general counsel, acquisition, procurement, if you have counterintelligence folks, your gates, guards, bads folks, all meet together. We talk about how and is the best way to implement an enterprise-wide solution supply chain. Every one of those folks, and probably more, and I would argue, depending on how big your company is, you should bring in your human resources folks, because they're the ones who hire the talent. They're the ones who hire the people who can fix this. They're also the ones who might hire someone who may down the road be an entire threat. The more folks in your company that you can have be part of this enterprise-wide security team, the more effective it's going to be. Once the team meets, over a cup of coffee, walk through the processes, then you have to design a policy. What is going to be our policy? What is going to be our checklist item so that if we're going to go out and procure a new system, a new television, a new microwave, a new refrigerator, and we'll get back to the refrigerator in a second, an IT system, printers, copiers, who should know that? Who should be aware? I didn't ask, that wasn't a rhetorical question. She says IT. Yes, the question is IT should be, should be aware. You think your security folks should be aware? Your CISO should be aware? Sure, right? Because what you should be bouncing off is, are there any known threats and vulnerabilities that we are aware of with this new system or thing we're buying? Have a policy. What do we do? How do we check it off? Put that policy together and make sure your general counsel and your CEO and your board understand. Number one, you have a policy for enterprise-wide security and supply chain. That's a great CYA for your company, right? Publicize that policy. Make sure all your employees know that you have this policy. Make it a company-wide, government-wide initiative that we are all in this together to protect our supply chain. From the very first employee that you hire tomorrow all the way up to the most senior employee that you have. The supply chain threat impacts all of us in this company. It's a marketing plan, but it's good business. Then, I would say twice a year, you practice this plan. You have a tabletop twice a year, led by the most senior individual in your company, your CEO, make sure your general counsel's there, have a few injects, talk about where we are, how we're doing as a company, progress that we've made with respect to our supply chain mitigation practices, what training we ever given our employees, and then have a real life hypothetical scenario. Walk through that scenario. What do you need to do? Who need to contact? So if you have penetration, and it looks like from what you see from your hired consultants or the government, it might be a foreign adversary who might have penetrated your company, what do you do? What's your crisis plan? God bless you. Who do you notify? How quick before you call the FBI? Do you call the FBI? What is, whose decision it is to make notification? The general counsels, the CEOs, the board of directors? Every company is going to be different, but have that process in place. And once you go through the first iteration of this, the second one will be that much easier. Because you will have a business process in place where you as a company or a government organization can implement solid supply chain mitigation risk factors to your company. And then what you're going to have is you're going to have key experts in your company go out to more conferences. And you're going to go to supply chain conferences. And you're going to have a supply chain consultant come in and you're going to find out, hey, here's a really cool checklist that's used by a very similar company than ours. We should incorporate this. And that'll make your next tabletop be more effective and efficient. And then you have a marketing plan that goes back to your lowest employee, but also your CEO and your board of directors take supply chain very, very seriously. I look at supply chain right now from the government's perspective as one of our top two threats facing our country. I always put aside the terrorist threat because the death of our American citizen and other citizens on our soil is first and foremost. Right? We all got that. We know that. We understand that. We live that every day. But as Secretary Mattis said in his recent um, Department of Defense program and a strategy, nation state threat actors are number one. <coughs> the existential threat that we face from our adversaries against our democracy is fastidious, it's aggressive, it's persistent, and we've, it's something we have not seen 
like this in a long time. It's manifested in two key areas for me. Number one, the critical infrastructure. Primarily three big factors of that are vectors of critical infrastructure, the way we look at it. Number one is our energy sector. Number two is our financial sector. And three is our telecommunications sector. We see every single day our adversaries successfully attempt penetrating those sectors and attempting to penetrate those sectors. In order to protect that critical infrastructure, in order to protect and prevent our lights going out, our telecommunications going down, and our financial sector having problems, we have to ensure the most effective and efficient supply chain process possible. That's how adversaries are getting to us, and that is, to me, supply chain threat. If you Google supply chain mitigation, you're gonna get a million things on this. Companies that do this for a living. But what we don't see in the government and private sector is the expeditious implementation of an effective supply chain mitigation program. And that's what Supply Chain Integrity Month is all about. Getting the message out. Build a team in your corporation, your government, Sensitize everybody to the importance of it. Train and practice. Make sure you have leadership that are involved and understand the subcontracting threat that we face. I have 10 minutes left, and I'm going to open up for some comments and questions before we move on to the panel. Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking. Yes. Thank you. This is very interesting. Um, I'm curious, you're standing under a banner that says intelligence and national security, and I'm sitting here thinking we have 17 intelligence agencies, four military services, Department of State, Energy, Homeland Security, Justice, all part of the national security apparatus. When one office in one of these agencies finds a you know, verified, valid threat, how do they make sure that everyone using that component or device knows that information? Can you talk about to what extent is information sharing institutionalized versus ad hoc and how it's working? That's great, great question. And uh, we have a lot um, we have a lot to improve on that process, but pretty, it's pretty effective in how we do it, whether or not it's um, how we collect it, right? So if we have a very classified way of how we collect that information, it's shared one way, and, but if we have known vulnerabilities from a separate perspective, it gets shared through FBI, through DHS, to not only the intelligence com uh, community, but as well as the private sector through, this, through the sectors. If we have a human or a SIGIN collection, that's cleansed and sent out as well. Um, but I think when you, when you ask about uh, the challenge we face, is how does it get to the private sector, right? So the FBI and DHS both have interlocutors to the private sector on this threat information, but it's typically at the unclassified level, right? So it's, it's kind of uh, sanitized. Um, one metaphor we'll talk about reality is Kaspersky, right? We've all heard of Kaspersky. So there was a manifested threat, a known threat, by the uh, FBI identified the intelligence community with the DHS. DHS sent out a binding um, directive to not use Kaspersky in the government, and that kind of leaked its way up to the private sector. Uh, we have to do a better job in the government taking that next step. What does this mean? Why can't or should you not use this particular software? And what is the potential damage for that? Um, the intelligence community does a really good job of aggregating that data, putting it together, and utilizing known conduits for dissemination. Typically, the intelligence community does not disseminate to the private sector. Um, our organization, NCSE, uh, we have a, a smaller role in that, kind of like we're doing now. But basically, that information comes from DHS and the FBI. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned that. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned that uh, every procurement decision is a security decision, and uh, very eloquently addressed that issue. How do you justify a lot of the departments of government looking to procure things at lowest cost, technically acceptable, and, and ending up with second-rate cyber or cyber protection? That's a, uh, another problematic issue we have right now, and it's very difficult with the economy being, and, and the procurement laws being set for 50 years to get exactly that in fairness, and you have all types of contracting regulations. What we can't do is go back and relitigate how we created our, our federal opposition regulations, right? Can't do that. But we can say now is there are national security exceptions, right? And we have utilized those exceptions. But we can't utilize the exceptions until we train and educate all acquisition and procurement folks first. 
what the threat is. And we're way behind on that. We have spent a lot of time in the Department of Defense the last couple <coughs> years and in the government and the acquisition procurement for training those individuals who are skilled at procuring things, understanding the threat that manifests in the contract and what are the factors that are there. So your, your point is, is super valid, um, but the contracting world is probably uh, something we have to hurry up and train and then make them aware that there are some, some efforts that we had a government organization that contracted with a company recently and then uh, found out the company may have some ties to foreign con company and they were able to cancel you know, 60,000 orders of something. So uh, there, there are ways to do that. But until we notify and train people, we're not going to be able to do that. One more question before I close it up. Um, you yeah. mentioned four different countries, uh, Iran and, and North Korea. Any particular company, the country that is uh, better at this than others? And secondly, can you tell us a little bit more information about what you said about the RIS and the DHS and the energy document or something? Like yeah, that? sure. Um, so first, your first question, and I have specifics here on that. Your second part of it is uh, two weeks ago, U.S. CERT and the FBI um, issued uh, it's called Russian government cyber activity targeting energy and other critical infrastructure sectors. It was an uh, unclassified report that went out uh, with respect to that threat, which included the Brits, uh, because they were targeting the British uh, energy sectors as well. The first part of your question is yes. So we are our adversaries target our, our critical infrastructure and supply chain very effectively. I would say that there's a difference in how they do it. It's not really nuanced. I think uh, one particular country, uh, China. Uh, their interest is more um, in an economic perspective, uh, the ability to uh, garner more stake in the uh, global economy. I think the Russians are more nefarious in terms of their capabilities intent to have future, um, we'll call it uh, nefarious activity in, in, our, in, our, in our systems, but not necessarily interested in stealing any of our technology, um, but where the, Russian, where the Chinese are more, more economically based and want to obtain some more technology. Uh, we have not seen you know, Iran's economy. Iran is, again, we've seen over publicly the last couple of years their intent on our critical infrastructure. That's been very well noted in the media uh, of, their, of their interest in some of our critical infrastructure, and that inf interest is nefarious. Right? There's, there's no, no intent on Iran to steal any of our technology, um, so it's more of a nefarious. So I would put Russia and Iran, North Korea, in the nefarious uh, side, and China more on the uh, attempt to steal our uh, proprietary information and trade secrets. Um, before we get to the panel, I want to say thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, remember, uh, today's the last day of Supply Chain Integrity Month, but uh, please take back uh, with you a couple things. Number one, uh, build a team, have a policy for that team, practice that team, and have a marketing plan to explain that supply chain security is enterprise-wide and should be responsible to everybody. Thanks for the opportunity, and I'll see you guys in a little bit.